Or imagine our two weights evened out into a wheel. Now the vectors at each point on the wheel diverge, so we have less available to be redirected. But just continue to think in terms of order of magnitude. Better yet, let's make a ring and let it hold itself together like a rotating circle of wire. If we can rotate a 10 meter in diameter circle of wire, we can rotate hundreds of circles of wire and bundle them together to get a heavier ring to increase the force available to propel the craft. Note here that no matter what we do, no matter how good our materials are, we can easily blow apart any wheel or ring by just spinning it ever faster. Sooner or later it will disintegrate. However, I think we can put enough force in our hypothetical ring to get our 100 G's and much more. If we can indeed redirect that force with the hypothesized field. Let's construct a ring. High tensile strength steel wire for pre-stressing concrete is about 5 millimeters in diameter and is 19.6 square millimeters in cross section. It has a mass of about 154 grams per meter and will break at around 1600 newtons per square millimeter. 1600 times 19.6 equals 32,000 newtons, and this is the tensile strength of this wire. 154 grams per meter times the 31.4 meter circumference of the ring gives us a total mass of 4.835 kilograms. This piece of wire will break at 32,000 newtons which is going to be the centripetal force when we spin it. So we plunk these values into our centripetal force equation and come up with a velocity of 182 meters per second, which is 5.8 hertz, and that's for a 31.4 meter circle circumference of wire, which is going to break at 32,000 newtons. Now, 306 strands of this wire at 5.8 hertz and 10 meters in diameter will give 9.8 million newtons. 306 times 4.835 kilograms per piece of wire equals 1,480 kilograms of wire in our 10,000 kilogram craft, or about 15% of the craft's weight. Since we can only utilize half the ring at best, and the vectors on that half are divergent, and our method of redirecting them is not 100% efficient, we're going to have to have a much heavier ring, heavier enough to rule out steel wire. A ring that's half the weight of the entire craft just doesn't seem right. Carbon nanotubes, our strongest known material, will give us 3,600 megapascals of tensile strength, and it has a mass of only 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter. A pascal is a measure of force per unit area. It's one newton per square meter. A megapascal is one million newtons per square meter. So a long piece of carbon nanotube with a cross section of one square centimeter will take a force of 3,600 times one million divided by 10,000, which is the square centimeters in a square meter, equals 360,000 newtons to break it. We need our ring to supply us with more than 9.8 million newtons. So we need uh, 9.8 million newtons divided by 360,000 equals uh, 27 strands to start with. One bundle of strands is then about 2.5 inches in diameter. Our 27 square centimeter strand will have a mass of 1.3 grams times 3140 centimeters, which is the length of a 10 meter diameter circle, times 27 strands equals 110,214 grams, or just about 110 kilograms, or about 240 pounds. This is pretty light stuff and doesn't take out much of the craft's 10,000 kilogram mass or much room. How fast does the ring spin to produce the required force? We put the known values in our centripetal force equation and get 9.8 million newtons 
which is the approximate force to propel a craft at 100 g's, equals 110 kilograms times v squared over the 5 meter radius of the ring, and that comes to a v squared of about 445,454 which translates into a velocity of 667 meters per second. That velocity divided by 31.4 meters gives us about 21 revolutions per second, or 21 hertz. If we want more acceleration, or if the process is not efficient, we simply need to add more strands to the ring until we get enough newtons to do the job. For instance, if we want to increase by tenfold the number of newtons, we put nine more 27-strand bundles of carbon nanotubing into the craft, thus increasing the ring's mass to 10 times 110 kilograms equals 1,100 kilograms of ring mass. Our craft is now 1,100 kilograms of carbon nanotube ring and 8,900 kilograms of craft, and our overall apparent power output considering the inefficiency of the entire process, might be on the order of 10 gigawatts instead of the previous 4.8 gigawatts, or about five Hoover dams running at full capacity. We can see then that if we can redirect vectors with the electromagnetic interaction, we can obtain the required horses to duplicate the observed UFO characteristics of extreme acceleration, hovering, and nearly silent flight by unbalancing the centrifugal force in a rotating ring. And we have that power on demand by switching on the electrical power to create the fields which unbalance those forces. P.S. Note here that you could make a tunnel ring and fill it with a hypothetical superfluid and spin that stuff at alien hertz rates and like that. But we don't have any realistic superfluids yet. Maybe they can get a ring as thin as a pencil made of something as yet unknown and get cooking on that. My calculations are limited to what we have on hand, or may soon have on hand. The big question then is, how do we redirect vectors? This has never been done before, and seems intuitively impossible and any real scientist would see immediately that it would lead directly to a violation of linear momentum conservation and consequently to the immediate and much dreaded loss of tenure. Hence, such an idea cannot be pursued by reputable scientists. Fortunately, I am not reputable and cannot lose my tenure because I haven't got any. So let's investigate the only possibility I can conceive of that might have a chance. I'll call it Neutron Inertial Polarization. Whoa, that's really slinging it now. I'm looking for a hypothetical weak interaction effect wherein a positive and negative charge forms at the front and rear of an accelerated gravitational field. This would be a theoretical link between the electromagnetic field and the gravitational field at the short-range particle level. In this relationship, the accelerating gravitational field around a neutron, which I call the beta field, becomes denser at the front end of an acceleration and less dense at the rear because the field cannot be notified of any change instantaneously. The electromagnetic field, which I call the alpha field, responds to this change in density by changing its density as well, so as to conserve the overall density of the both of them. By doing this, it embodies its existence relative to the gravitational field. The electromagnetic and gravitational fields must interact in some way, else they can't logically be said to exist relative to one another. 